And I call on Rosanna Cunningham to open this afternoon's proceedings. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This is the first time, to the best of my knowledge, that the Scottish Parliament has had the opportunity to focus on the future of Scotland's environment and economy in one joint debate. It's an innovation I welcome because, of course, our environment and economy are intrinsically linked. They're often seen as competing priorities for any government, but the level of ambition set out by the First Minister in her programme for government requires fresh thinking and bold ideas. Scotland's transition to a more prosperous, low-carbon economy is already well underway. We've created jobs and backed innovative new industries while winning international respect for our ambition and leadership on climate change, the defining environmental issue of our age. The First Minister has made clear we have an overriding moral duty to fight climate change. No one sitting in the public gallery following this debate at home in Scotland or listening from afar should be in any doubt about the commitment of this government or to the credit of MSPs of all parties, the commitment of this parliament. So, a moral duty. Yes, not least when we consider the threat facing the world's poorest people, those who did the least to cause climate change in the first place. We must also protect ourselves, our families, homes and communities from the threat of more extreme weather occurring more often. We also have to protect our natural environment, not only for its inherent value, but also because our natural capital underpins our national prosperity. Our farmers need healthy soils. Our fishermen need healthy seas. But it's true too that cities offering a high quality of life through the provision of green space and active travel networks are also the most competitive in attracting the brightest and the best scientists, innovators, and researchers. So ambition and innovation lie at the very heart of our programme for government. The low carbon economy is already worth more than £10 billion to Scotland's economy and supports nearly 60,000 jobs. But it is time to go further and faster. There are huge opportunities in the low carbon sector, especially in terms of the technological and business innovation that will be needed to support our climate change ambitions. Our proposed new climate change bill will increase our long-term targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 90% by 2050. This is a tough target. Indeed, the Committee on Climate Change advised that a 90% reduction is, and I quote, currently at the very limit of feasibility, unquote. But these are challenging times, and we will work with Scottish businesses to ensure they are best placed to respond. Independent research published by Ernst & Young shows that the challenges we must confront also have the potential to bring significant benefits to the Scottish economy. Indeed, analysis by the International Finance Corporation indicates that the Paris Agreement will help open up $23 trillion worth of global opportunities for climate smart investments in emerging markets between 2016 and 2030. And Scotland must be in a position to benefit from these opportunities. I mentioned earlier the time has come to go further faster. In short, we must accelerate our transition to a low carbon economy. The circular economy agenda is one that is increasingly understood and embedded in Scotland. It has been recognized internationally. It is an approach where Scotland is being and seen to be creative, pushing against historic approaches with innovative and creative solutions. And this government's ambitions for the introduction of electric vehicles demonstrate our ambition and intent. With our commitment in the PFG to phase out the need for petrol and diesel cars and vans by 2032, far ahead of the UK government's recent 2040 commitment, we have risen to the challenge. This commitment reflects our ambition to reduce carbon emissions, improve air quality, and generate valuable economic opportunities. This morning, I joined the First Minister at the iconic Riverside Museum building in Glasgow to view the latest electric and low emission vehicles and talk about the rollout of our ambitious new plans for a network of low emission zones. As the First Minister said, electric vehicles are the technology of today as well as tomorrow. But there are challenges as well as opportunities. For example, how best should we provide on-street charging facilities in Scotland's densely populated cities? How best do we ensure rural motorists who face the highest petrol and diesel costs 
quickly benefit from the lower running costs electric vehicles offer? How do we ensure electric vehicles help balance demand with supply from renewable sources of, generations, uh, uh, sources of generation? So these are big questions, yes, but the issues represent valuable opportunities too. Our own power companies and universities are already working on solutions. And today we've invited the brightest and the best from across Europe and around the world to come to Scotland to work with businesses and researchers, safe in the knowledge that this government and its agencies will support them on the journey to a low carbon future. The PFG shows that going green doesn't put us in the red. Harnessing our natural and human capital not only adds to our well-being, but is integral to our nation's future economic success. Thank you. Dean Lockhart to be followed by Ivan McKee. Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a privilege to take part in today's debate. My remarks will be focused on the economic aspects of the programme for government. The programme quite rightly recognises that Scotland's economy has immense potential, that we should all be ambitious for Scotland and work towards the objectives of building a modern, dynamic, open economy, an economy that benefits everyone. We share these objectives. And where there is common ground on the economy, we will work constructively with the government towards these objectives. However, in looking at the substance of the programme, we must remember this is a government that has over-promised and under-delivered in every year it's been in power. A government that has shown itself to be incapable of realising Scotland's economic potential, presiding over average growth of less than 1% each year on average of the 10 years you've been in power and a government that has failed to deliver on a number of its own key policy commitments. Take for example the Scottish Growth Scheme. Announced in the programme for government last year, the First Minister described it as a half billion pound vote of confidence in Scottish business and promised 500 million of government guarantees and loans to help business. One year later not a single business has received a single penny. More importantly, the type of financial assistance available has changed fundamentally. In place of government-backed loans, it was announced in June that the scheme will now take the form of equity investments to be made by private equity funds. So instead of business receiving government loans and guarantees, as promised by the First Minister, they will now have to sell part of their business to private equity funds if they want any financing under this scheme. Even by SNP standards, this is a shameful sellout of Scottish business. Now, with policy like this, it's not surprising that after 10 years of SNP government, the SNP economy is a low growth, low wage, low innovation and low enterprise economy. Yes, I will. Cabinet Secretary. Dean Lockhart, first of all, for taking the intervention. And can I assume from the remarks he just made, first of all, that he's got nothing to say to the UK government achieving the potential of the UK economy since they've only got a quarter of the growth that we have? Or does he still believe that it's all on the head and shoulders, as he said in our local newspaper, the Stirling Observer, on the SNP government? Or like the Scotland office, does he think that the UK government has a role in the Scottish economy as well? Mr Lockhart, don't worry because we've took time in hand, so you'll make it up for interventions. I could see the concern on your face. <laughs> Thank you very much. We welcome the fact that uh, Scotland avoided a recession in the first quarter of the year. However, I would ask the Cabinet Secretary, is he pleased that growth in Scotland over the last two years is 0.5% over the last two years, and that growth under your government in the last decade has averaged less than 1%? That's not a track record that, that you should be proud for. That is not being stronger for Scotland. Presiding officer, for Scotland to realise its full potential to become a high-wage, high-growth, innovative and enterprising economy, we need a new direction in policy. And this programme for government is not the answer. Instead, we need to create the right environment for the creation of high-wage, high-skilled jobs. To do this, the SNP must reverse its policy of making Scotland the highest tax part of the UK for those high-skilled jobs. Any suggestion... I, I need to make a bit of progress, thank you. Any suggestion yesterday... Any Just sit down, Mr Stewart. I'll make the comments. Thank you. <laughs> Mr Stevenson, sorry. Any suggestion yesterday by the First Minister to further increase the tax burden in Scotland for highly skilled workers would be the wrong policy response. Concerns have already been expressed by leading organisations that further SNP tax increases would further damage 
the Scot the Scotland's economy. On enterprise development, we welcome the government following our lead in establishing the South of Scotland Agency and retaining separate boards for High and the other agencies and in appointing a business leader, not a minister, to chair the new strategic board. But much more needs to be done. The Scottish Government spends over £2 billion a year on skills and enterprise development. That's £100 more per person on enterprise development than the rest of the UK. But in return, Scotland has one of the lowest rates of business creation and expansion in the UK, and the private sector in Scotland is much smaller than the UK average. So we need to see a higher return on this £2 billion investment. And we look forward to debating the policy options once the strategic board is operational. But one step this government can take immediately to encourage the expans expansion of business is to follow the Barclay recommendation to reduce the large business supplement and bring it into line with the rest of the UK. And we encourage the government to do so immediately. Yes, I will. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I ask the, the member, and I appreciate I'm taking the, the intervention, what revenue raising proposals will the Conservatives bring to the table to fund uh, any investments that we may happen to make in terms of the Barclay recommendations? Mr Lockhart. Well, Cabinet Secretary, we've had this discussion before that you've had 10 years to grow the economy and boost tax revenues. That's the real way that you can boost tax revenues, grow the economy. <laughs> Presiding officer, in the area of trade and exports, the programme for government lacks detail on how we can ex expand our export base, an urgent priority given that less than 70 businesses represent 50% of our exports. It also lacks ideas on how we can expand trade with our single largest market, the rest of the UK. The depreciation of sterling gives rise to a number of economic opportunities, including import substitution. Something highlighted, actually, in this debate last year by Alex Neil, but again, this is yet another opportunity missed by this government, and we see no policy initiative on that front. Presiding officer, 10 years is more than enough time for any government to prove whether or not it can deliver meaningful change. This is a government that has shown time and again it doesn't understand the economy and is incapable of realising Scotland's potential. After a decade of SNP mismanagement, it's time for a new direction in SNP, in economic policy, and this programme for government is not the answer. Thank you, Mr Lockhart. I call Ivan McKee to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Mr McKee, please. Uh, thank you. The Parliament will no doubt be aware by now of my role as Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy. Presiding Officer, today's debate on the Scottish Government's programme for government is focused on the economy and it's focused on the environment. And this linkage is not an accident because the long-term future of Scotland's economy will be built on sectors central to the protection of our environment. <coughs> Not just through exploiting innovations in the renewable energy sector, but through the use of Scotland's landscape, voted the most beautiful in the world recently by the Rough Guide as a magnet for the growth of our tourism sector. The quality of our food and drink process, world-renowned for the purity of its ingredients and a major part of Scotland's exports. The transformation of our transport sector towards renewable sources of power and the ability of our creative industries to leverage on the heritage and global recognition of Brand Scotland. Simply put, Scotland's environment is an engine for growth, a green engine for inclusive growth. This programme has this symbiotic relationship between the economy and the environment at its core, and it's built on an understanding that Scotland needs to be bold to lead in the global race to harness the green economy in order to deliver future prosperity for this country and its people. Building the environment into the economy of the future runs like a green thread through this programme. The investment in carbon capture and storage technology through support for the ACORN project at St Fergus, picked up by this government showing leadership after it was abandoned by Westminster. Help for key growth sectors, advanced manufacturing, in particular lightweight manufacturing technologies focused on reducing carbon emissions and the creation of the new Manufacturing Institute for Scotland to begin in 2018. The introduction of a deposit return scheme, another step towards putting us in the fast lane of the circular economy, taking the lead in promoting the use of ultra low emission vehicles, phasing out new diesel and petrol cars and vans by 2032, driving innovation that will meet head on the technological challenges of this technology shift through the establishment of an innovation fund, investing a further £60 million pounds to deliver low carbon energy infrastructure solutions including battery storage and electric vehicle charging. 
not only providing the infrastructure that Scotland needs for low emission vehicles, but supporting the innovative businesses that can develop and export that technology. And while Brixton may have its electric avenue, we are going to have the A9, our very own electric highway, move over Eddie Grant. The programme for government also takes some other significant steps to support Scotland's businesses and entrepreneurs. The addition of a Paris hub to those in London, Dublin and Berlin and the creation of a network of trade envoys to promote Scottish exports and inward investment. The establishment of FinTech Scotland to accelerate the development of the financial services technology ecosystem in Scotland. Access to capital for growing businesses through the establishment of a Scottish National Investment Bank. Increased commitment to government support for business research and development and the rollout of super price broadband to 100% of Scotland's homes and businesses. But like all good business and innovation initiatives, value for money is key. Hence the creation of the Strategic Enterprise and Skills Board to oversee the £2 billion that is spent annually on economic and skills development in Scotland, ensuring focus on outcomes and support for key target sectors. The role of the entrepreneur is key to building the high-tech green economy of the future in Scotland. <coughs> People who can build businesses and take risks, and the role of government is to nourish and support that ecosystem. The launching of the Unlocking Ambition Challenge to invest in talented early-stage entrepreneurs is welcome. And here I want to recognise the inclusion in this programme for government of work on a citizen's income, because like all good initiatives, this policy delivers in several core areas simultaneously. Citizens' income isn't just a social measure providing a safety net, important as it is. If implemented correctly, it is also a huge boost to entrepreneurial activity, giving space and support to those who want a soft entry into the world of work or starting up their own business. Those who want to try and fail and try again, the true definition of an entrepreneur. Those who want to focus on building a life and a business rather than the ridiculous dance with a benefit system that punishes those trying to get back into work with effective marginal tax rates that would make additional rate taxpayers' eyes water. And I welcome the focus on resolving once and for all the problem of rough, rough sleeping on our streets because the reality is that we cannot seriously consider ourselves to be a dynamic, successful society while that problem remains unresolved. I am working to find common ground in my city with the business community and the third sector and local government how best to fix this problem. And I welcome the emphasis the programme for government places on this issue. The programme for government and its focus on innovation through the green economy that has been widely praised by, amongst others, Friends of the Earth, WWF, the Simon Community and Greenpeace. Scotland has no shortage of opportunity. We are blessed with natural and human resources that are at the envy of the world and with an industrial heritage to be proud of. But Scotland's future economic success will be built on the technologies and entrepreneurs of the future, and the place of the environment in that future economy cannot be overstated. This government recognises that and is determined to provide the strategy, framework and support to make it happen, to send a clear signal that Scotland is the place for innovation in digital and low-carbon technology. And this programme for government, presiding officer, is a bold and ambitious step in that direction. Uh, thank you. Before I, I call the next speaker, can I just say to members, while I understand that members are focusing on the economy and the environment, that this is a continuation of an open debate on the Scottish Government's programme for government, so they are not restricted to those topics. It's just to make it plain, if anyone's concerned that we're coming in to speak about something other than those two. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Ms Bailey, please. Presiding officer, yesterday the First Minister started her speech reflecting on the apparent success of the SNP government over the past 10 years. We were treated to the usual airbrushing of reality, selective memory and assertion that we have now come to know so well from the First Minister. And where? Where were the economic achievements? Of course there was mention of unemployment rates and falling unemployment is always welcome, but absolutely no mention of rising economic inactivity. Instead, we have a programme for government which is strong on rhetoric about the importance of the economy, but light on the action needed to secure economic growth. So rather than the partial view offered by the SNP, let me paint a more complete picture of the Scottish economy. Because I know, I know the SNP only want to use the most recent GDP figures for the last quarter. Crowing about growth that is a mere 0.7% 
is a measure of the lack of ambition at the heart of this government. It is perhaps more useful to look at long-term trends. Over the last 10 years, output per head in Scotland, a key measure of economic progress, has grown by just 1.02%. For the eight years, no, I think you should sit and listen to this. For the eight years, the eight years before that, from 1999 to 2007, output per head grew by 20.4%. That's 20 times more under Labour Cabinet than Secretary, is the case please. for the whole of the SNP's tenure in office. And I'll take an intervention from Keith Brown to explain that. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank uh, uh, Jackie Bailey, not for her comments, but for taking the intervention, and ask whether she thinks, given what she describes as the uh, economic performance over the last 10 years, if any of that is at all attributable to the mismanagement of the economy by the Labour Party, which led us into the worst recession in history, and the last words of the Labour government, which was, there is no money left. Uh, uh, I, it, Ms Bailey, it's for me to decide when the member sits down, but I call you now, Ms Bailey. Well, Presiding officer, I asked the Cabinet Secretary a question. He failed to answer that question, that growth under Labour was 20 times more than is the case for the whole of the SNP's tenure in office. And let me respond to him, because I'll take no lessons from the SNP. Remember, of course, it was that wonderful economist, Alex Salmond, who called for even more deregulation of the banks. Well, thank goodness we didn't listen to him. Because it's nearly 10 years, 10 years, since ambitious targets were set for Scotland's economy. We have an economic strategy that's not been refreshed despite Brexit, and there is no real attempt to evaluate what works. In truth, the SNP has been content for our economy to dawdle along in the slow lane. Ministers boast about closing the productivity gap with the rest of the UK, and whilst movement in that direction is welcome, let's take a little closer look. Productivity actually fell back in 2016. Our productivity in Scotland and the UK is 15% lower than the G7 average. And despite a target from the Scottish Government to raise us to that top quartile of productivity, we dropped to the third quartile before clawing our way back to be in the second. Hardly an Oscar-winning performance. It's unfortunately true to say that across a range of economic measures, Scotland's performance lags behind the rest of the UK. Indeed, it's only in 12 out of 41 quarters that Scotland's annual growth has been the same or better than the UK's. Now, that's woeful, but it has serious implications for the amount we receive in Barnet as part of the fiscal framework. Lower growth, lower tax revenue means a lower block grant. So growing the Scottish economy has never been more important or more urgent. Yet I didn't get that sense of urgency from the First Minister yesterday. What we were offered was a series of re-announcements from a regressive retread government. Trade envoys promised last year, yet to be delivered, re-announced. Scottish growth scheme promised last year, and when we asked about this a month ago, not a single payment made, re-announced. National Manufacturing Institute, promised last year, yet to be delivered, re-announced. And then there's the National Investment Bank. Now, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, so I thank you for copying Labour's idea. But there's no detail about how it will work or where the money's coming from. And if it's anything, anything like the Scottish Development Bank, announced and re-announced, I counted six times. I look forward to the National Investment Bank still being a work in progress and re-announced next year. That is a woeful performance. And let me turn to the money for research and development. Absolutely welcome. But you know, presiding officer, it plugs a gap that was created by the SNP. Leaked emails from Scottish Enterprise show that research and development budget has already been spent and we've still got more than half the year to go. And grants will no longer be paid in advance. So if you're lucky, if you're really lucky, you might get something in May 2018. That too is a woeful performance. And what impact does the programme for government have on hard-pressed workers? Well, insecure work in Scotland has soared under the SNP, up by a third. Working poverty is at its highest level since devolution, and they should be ashamed about that. The number of people earning less than the living wage, a priority for this government, has gone up. 
and the cost of living has gone up and wages have declined. Now, I welcome the lifting of the pay cap for public sector workers. It's just a shame you voted against Labour's proposal to do just that earlier this year. It's been seven years since public sector workers had a wage rise. But what was missing from the First Minister's announcement is the machinery for that negotiation and whether it will be fully funded from the Scottish Government's coffers, I will indeed. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Would I appreciate Jackie Bailey taking the intervention. Would Jackie take the position of the Scottish uh, Government, which is that we will lead on lifting the pay cap, or does she take the position of Welsh Labour, which is to wait for the Tory Government to see what they do? Can Ms. I, Bailey, you have one more minute. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I will be brief. Can I say I welcome the lifting of the pay cap? It was Labour in this Parliament that called for it, standing alongside the RCN and Unison at a time where the government, Derek Mackay, was not listening. You were deaf. You were deaf. Well, I was elected to the Scottish Parliament, not the Welsh Parliament. So the Cabinet Secretary, if he wished to keep shouting from a sedentary position, is really, is really pathetic. And can can, I say, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but please don't have a debate across the chamber and not through the chair. Can I say, Presiding Officer, um, when I look at the Scottish Government's <coughs> efforts, having cut £1.5 billion from local services, it would be breathtaking if they asked local government and the NHS to fund the pay rise themselves. I take no joy, presiding officer, in what is a fragile and failing economy, because I want Scotland to flourish and I want its people to prosper, but it is not doing so under the SNP. To understand the challenge, you need to acknowledge where we are and stop being in denial. With the SNP, rhetoric triumphs over action. With the SNP, re-announcements are the order of the day. Frankly, it is about time that the SNP stop behaving like an ostrich, lifts its head out of the sand and gets serious with the economy. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson, followed by Jamie Halker johnson Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me uh, just start my remarks by directing through you uh, some comments about uh, Dean Lockhart's speech. Um, he refers to Scotland as the most highest tax place uh, in the UK. Well, of course, uh, with a 25% difference in local taxation on premises between Scotland and England, it may be as well that we remind ourselves of which is the higher, and it ain't Scotland, it's England. It's also in Scotland where we have 100,000 businesses taken out of uh, local taxation altogether. We take different solutions in a different environment, but we certainly aren't the highest tax uh, part of the UK. But the other thing that I think uh, he might consider talking to his colleagues at Westminster about is the plans revealed inadvertently, it seems, uh, to exclude, in particular in my constituency, thousands of workers that are in the fish processing industry from future employment, simply because of their nationality not being that of being UK citizens. If he genuinely thinks, genuinely thinks, that that is a contribution to the Scottish economy, shutting down factories in the northeast of Scotland and elsewhere in other industries, then I'm afraid he is deluded in the extreme. No. I want to talk primarily about, uh, about uh, the environment. And I particularly welcome the addition of the A9 uh, as an electric road to our existing electric road. I refer, of course, to the A719 and the electric Bray, which is in the vicinity uh, of Ayrshire. So this second electric road in Scotland uh, will be a true piece of innovation. Now, of course, that's connected to the ambition to basically be all electric or all renewable transport uh, by 2032. Now, that's a bold ambition to set because we're not in control of everything that has to happen to make it happen. And the reason, well, I will come back, if I may. I will come back, though, simply because at the moment, 
it would be very difficult for a car to drive from Edinburgh to Inverness, however many charging points there are, because you need to stop and recharge most electric cars. I will take an intervention from Patrick Harvey. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I'm grateful. Perhaps the member would uh, be so helpful as to clarify. He said the ambition was for Scotland to be uh, wholly electric on transport by 2032. My recollection from yesterday's statement was that new cars and vans that were petrol and diesel would not be available for sale after that point. That's very different from not using them. Um, Stuart Stevenson. I, I accept what the member says. And if there was an imprecision, um, I'm happy. But, but let's be quite clear. It's a very ambitious thing uh, for us to do, but we should not shy from ambition. Uh, when we uh, all uh, of those of us who were here in 2009 discussed the climate change bill, we did so in a cross-party consensus where every party represented in the parliament made a contribution uh, to the resulting uh, 2009 Climate Change Act. That is the sort of consensus that I hope that we will continue to sustain on subjects of climate change. It's interesting that uh, in the United States, where uh, the president uh, has withdrawn from the Paris Accord, uh, the Washington Post reports this very morning uh, that the advice he received that caused him to do that uh, was from a right-wing think tank who's looked at the scientific consensus that there is that climate change exists and it is anthropogenic in its origins, but that the very existence of the consensus demonstrates that there is a scientific conspiracy to delude the public. Now, anyone who believes that uh, believes in the tooth fairy and a wide range uh, of other things. It's quite the most disappointing thing that's happened in the world of climate change in recent years. And it reinforces the need for climate change leaders such as Scotland to continue to apply themselves to this. We're going to find it very hard in the rest of the world uh, to compensate for the over emissions that come from the United States, but that shouldn't top us, stop us trying uh, to do something. Now, in relation to my constituency, uh, we've heard about the ACON project at St. Fergus, very welcome investment there. It's worth also looking at the High Wind Project, which is a floating wind farm which Statoil, the Norwegian oil company, uh, are installing off the coast of Peterhead. Reusing engineering skills that we have here, but fundamentally, and this goes to the heart of the long-term failure of the UK government, uh, at how you can recycle with the right proper regime the monies from the oil industry to put into renewables. Statoil is the state oil company, founded in 1972 on the back of the oil wealth of Norway. Whereas in the UK, the Scottish oil resources were frankly flushed away in current account spending and not invested in the future. That is the most shameful long-run failure uh, of the UK government in relation to Scotland and Scotland's economy, one that we live with today and have limited opportunity uh, to do uh, very much about. Uh, Hurricane Harvey is a wake-up call about climate change. It has, I must say, of course, impacted uh, uh, the, the price of oil worldwide. A quarter of the United States uh, refineries are now shut down. Pollution and disease is awash in Houston and surrounding areas. Climate change is fundamentally an issue for the whole world. Yes, most critically for the world least able to respond to it in Africa and the Middle East. But for all of us, climate change is the biggest challenge. We in Scotland, I hope, will continue to have a broad consensus about the need to engage in this and support the measures. We'll continue a vigorous debate about the detail. That's entirely proper. But I hope that we will sustain the consensus that took the Climate Change Act to the legisl into legislation in 2009. High ambition then. Stepping it up now, this government has a record second to none on climate change, on the environment, and indeed on the economy. Presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. I call Jamie Harcrow Johnson to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Mr. Johnson, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I refer members to my register of interests. 
Um, I'm pleased to be able to speak in today's debate, both as my party's uh, spokesman on jobs, employability and training, but also as a representative of the Highlands and Islands. Uh, and I'd echo my colleague Dean Lockhart's comments that where we can find common ground with the Scottish Government, where we are more than willing to work with them to promote Scotland's economic growth. But it is fair for opposition parties such as ours to question where we don't find common ground or where we feel the Scottish Government is failing. Under the SNP, the skills and education sector has suffered. College places have been cut, money from the apprenticeship levy, which the, the Scottish Government said would go towards funding apprenticeships, has been used for other programmes. We've been contacted by one businessman, I'm going to get on please, I'm going to get on please, thanks, um, who said, and I quote, government is not making it easy for businesses to be competitive whilst affording our young people employment opportunities. He warns that the way the Scottish Government has implemented the apprenticeship levy, and I quote, puts the good employers at a disadvantage in terms of business development and profitability. I'm going to get on, please. We want to see the money raised by the apprenticeship levy spent on apprenticeships, not diverted off by the Scottish Government to other programmes. And while the Scottish Government's announcement of 30,000 apprenticeship places by 2020 is welcome, it's not new. Minister, Minister, members not taking intervention, please sit down. This is just another rehashed policy being re-announced, and one that will still leave us falling behind other parts of the UK. The Scottish Government, the Scottish Conservatives, sorry, want to go further. We want to see the new apprenticeship levy invested in 35,000 apprenticeship places by 2021. I'll give way. Minister. Well, uh, it's uh, very welcome that you've finally given me, Mr. Halkodron, so I thank you uh, for doing that. I, I wonder if uh, the member could first of all reflect on the fact that it was the UK government that introduced the levy without any prior consultation, not only with this Scottish government, but with any uh, levy peer whatsoever. And would he also recognise that whilst he is uh, suggesting that we, as an administration, haven't invested uh, all the money where we said we would, we under unlike the UK government, we undertook a consultation and we're implementing exactly what the consultation told us, which was not to go to 35,000 modern apprenticeship starts, was to stick with the commitment we had made. That was what the voice of employers, including businesses, were telling us. Well, Mr. So, well, Halker Jones. Sorry, I'm glad the Minister admits that uh, they're not investing money where they said they would. <laughs> we, want to see ten new, we want to see 10 new skills academies across Scotland by the end of this decade similar to the successful Digital Skills and Coding Academy code plan, and we would reverse the SNP college cuts with an extra 60 million every year for the sector. Yep. And looking wider, we would be encouraging closer working relationships between schools, colleges and local businesses. And there are some good examples of this already, one of which Armand en um, Engineering I visited earlier this week with the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. But we also need to take a wider look at how we educate and train for the future. Some of the questions we will ask will be tough, but we owe our young people an open and honest debate before its future, which is at stake. It starts with accepting that no path should be predetermined or pre-favoured. We should ask whether university has become the default destination of choice at the expense of college, apprenticeship and other training routes, which might be more suitable for many. And that when young people have chosen a path, whichever it is, does that chosen path adequately prepare for their future career or the fight for the wider working environment? Above all, we seek an economy which provides the right opportunities for young people who can move from school to university, college, apprenticeships or other training with confidence that jobs and opportunities will be available for them once they leave. They make an investment, whether that's in financial terms or just in time. They need and deserve to see a return on that investment. As a Highlands and Islands MSP, I represent an area which is diverse as it is large. It's a region with an entrepreneurial spirit almost unmatched in Scotland. North Sea decommissioning should provide huge opportunities for the region, and having met with Lowick Port Authority, one of the first ports in the UK to handle significant offshore decommissioning projects early in the year, I was extremely impressed with their expanded deep water infrastructure at Dalesvoe, where they're already decommissioning the 12,000 tonne Buck and Alpha. And in Orkney, there's been investment in Copeland's Dock in, Dock in Stromness and at Hatstead in Kirkwall. Hatstead's now able to cater for some of the largest cruise liners in the world. In last year's skills assessment, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, now saved from the SNP's acts, identified IT as a sector with the largest projected employment growth in the region. And of course, there is a traditional industry such as farming and fishing, both of which are still extremely important and major employers, and both linked to the region's world-class food and drink sector, Shetland seafood, Orkney's meat and cheeses, 
and of course Murray, the home of whiskey. There are also important small businesses, in many ways the bedrock of the, uh, the economy and vital if you want to see growth. Business creation has lagged behind the Scottish average, uh, average in recent years. It is clear they need support and clearer still, in some cases at least, they're not getting it. In remote and not so remote communities, we still re see real potential, but also significant challenges. In the region, we have fewer people than the Scottish average with no qualifications, but a lower proportion with higher level qualifications. They have certainly been some successes, with the main sector for apprenticeships being in hospitality, construction and food and drink. It would seem there has been responsiveness to the local economic needs. But we still need to consider further where there are real gaps in provision and to what extent the long-standing southward migration for education, skills and opportunities to hold back the highlands, continue sorry, to hold back the highlands and islands. There is real concern at the impact the growth in tourism of having on overstretched local infrastructure in some part. Mm. Welcome growth, but it still causes issues. In Orkney, there's been a heated, albeit relatively one-sided, debate on the introduction of a tourist tax. Like the vast majority of people locally, I'm not in favour of that. But it does highlight the need for investment in local infrastructure and, and find out how that's paid for. The hospitality industry has spoken extensively on the shortcomings in the current business rate scheme and are disappointed by the challenges proposed by the Barclay Review. We should... I'm going to finish, if you don't mind. We should aim to create a system of taxation that recognises the needs, distinct needs, of the sect sectors across Scotland. Meanwhile, the traditional industries of farming and fishing are facing real challenges. Incomes in the rural, rural economy have fallen over recent years and adequate support is essential. But that support needs to be paid on time and that isn't happening. That makes it increasingly hard for local farmers to plan for the future, having a knock-on effect on the wider agricultural sector and rural economy. Our transport connections and the infrastructure are key to the region's economic growth. We now have competition on the Northern Isles air routes, but we need reliable service, one which is more reasonably priced. Communications infrastructure also has come top of our priorities. Increasingly, we find mobile and broadband connectivity becoming intertwined and should look to mobile networks to work together. I'm sure all of those who, repre all of those who represent uh, constituents in the Highlands and Islands or in the region itself can agree that the rollout of broadband has been too slow, that service is too unreliable and there are still too many mobile hotspots and slow Please broadband conclude. in the region. Please conclude. So in conclusion, we need a Scottish government that is up to the challenge of addressing these issues. Unfortunately, yesterday's programme of government however, suggest that the current government is both out of touch and out of ideas. Thank you. I call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Mark Ruskell, please. Ms Grant. Thank you, presiding officer. The programme for government has many references to digitisation, the development of infrastructure and skills, the digital first service standard where public services are delivered digitally first and foremost. Those are laudable aims, but miss the point that many of our citizens have no access to digital connectivity and have little prospect of getting these in the near future. I can't overestimate the urgency of the need. People are being left behind, not able to access services and jobs, not being able to communicate with friends and family, and certainly not enjoying the digital media that others take for granted. This is predominantly in rural areas, but many inner city urban areas are also in the same situation. These are the areas that are used to being left behind. They faced a financial divide, a divide with regard to jobs and opportunities, and they now face a digital divide. The Scottish Government have pledged superfast broadband for all by 2021. However, they won't begin this rollout until 2018. They've been in government for 10 years. They still have vast swathes of Scotland to cover, the most challenging areas of Scotland, where there are geographical challenges and market failure. Do they really believe that they'll cover these areas in two short years at the end of their term in government? In the meantime, these communities are told to wait. It simply is not good enough. Communities who have procured and installed their own broadband are now being asked by the Scottish Government to evaluate their own systems, to provide the assurance that their infrastructure is sustainable to fulfil the 2021 promise. Rather than encouraging and assisting communities, they're questioning their achievements while expecting them to deliver the government's pledge. This government needs to work with our digitally excluded communities now to get them connected as soon as possible, rather than promise them connection in four years' time. They're already left behind, far behind, and in four years, they'll be even worse. Will the member take an I will. Uh, is the member aware of Schedule 5 
Section C, subsection 10 uh, of the 1998 Scotland Act, which shows that internet access is a reserved power. Will she therefore congratulate the Scottish Government in making good the shortfall that arrives entirely from inaction at Westminster? Rhoda Grant. If the Scottish Government weren't assuming um, responsibility for digital connectivity, they wouldn't have been making that promise. So why make the commitment if it's not your responsibility and you're washing your hands of it? And certainly don't make a promise that you can't live up to because that is simply unfair. While, while setting digital as a standard in the programme for government, it does nothing to address the lack of digital connectivity. It doesn't address either the the disaster that was the CAP Futures Programme. It says nothing about, us, about when the system is going to work for crofters and farmers. It doesn't inspire confidence in the Scottish Government's ability to deliver full connectivity by 2021. The rural, rural economy is dependent on connectivity, be that digital infrastructure or indeed road, rail and ferries. These communities don't operate with a level playing field due to distances from market. The European Union understood this. Their policies on peripherality saw the building of causeways, bridges, roads in rural Scotland. And there's a real fear that due to withdrawal from the EU, these priorities and spending will disappear. Neither of our governments has shown commitment to creating a level playing field for our rural and remote areas. And I would specifically ask the Scottish Government to commit to this now. Cabinet Secretary. Rona Grant for taking intervention and say that I agree with her about the point about the dangers of uh, leaving the EU and how we replace the money that previously came from that source. But she must recognise through the road equivalent tariff, the investment in uh, new ferries, investment in new routes, that there has been a substantial improvement under the Scottish Government. At least you should recognise that fact. Rhoda Grant. I, I certainly um, acknowledge the implementation of the road equivalent tariff. I'm really disappointed that that was removed from commercial vehicles because that was a tax on everybody who lives in an island. And I think we need to look at the way we support islands uh, rather than put extra costs on them. Our crofting and farming communities fear that the scarce resources um, that will take place of cap payments will be given to the most the biggest and the most accessible farms rather than supporting producers and communities in rural areas that desperately need additional resources to keep working our rural communities depend on successful farms and crofts to sustain them and retain the population and i welcome Pillar 1 cap payments being continued by both our governments. But rural communities are also concerned about Pillar 2 funding, for example, LEADER, that supports small initiatives that provide a disproportionately large benefit to rural communities. While it's difficult at the moment to make commitments in monetary terms, we can ask that the government be clear about the policy backdrop on these spending decisions and how they will be made going forward. We ask that they commit to breaking down barriers and investing in rural and remote communities that need most help and protecting our environment and delivering public goods. The programme for government is largely warm words and lacking in detail, and where there is detail, this is sometimes worrying. While acknowledging the good work of Highlands and Islands Enterprise in the past, the Scottish Government suggests that the new strategic board will have control of all enterprise budgets. I quote, establishing a new strategic board to coordinate the work of our enterprise and skills agencies to ensure maximum impact of our two billion investment each year in enterprise and skills. We had a vote in the Parliament, a commitment from the Cabinet Secretary, and yes, the Scottish Government is still fixated in centralising control of enterprise and economic development. It simply doesn't work for rural areas, and it's the exact opposite of European policy on peripherality. We've been promised devolved powers through the Islands Bill, and still there's no detail about what those powers will be. A bill is again warm words, but no detail whatsoever on what that will mean to islanders, their daily lives and how they will be empowered. I urge the Scottish Government to be more ambitious for our rural and remote communities, to trust people to know what their communities need, what will work for them and to help them achieve that. Thank you. 
I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Mr Ruskell, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by welcoming much of what we heard yesterday from the First Minister and reaffirm the Greens' intention to contribute to the government's programme in our usual constructively critical way. I think in that regard, it's slightly disappointing that the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform isn't now in this debate. I mean, maybe this debate is on the telly somewhere in the Scottish Parliament, but I would have appreciated the opportunity to, to debate some of the points that I'm going to raise with her. The need for a post-recess reset became clear in June for this government as it became slightly bogged down in issues from teacher workloads to tail docking. And on some issues such as air quality, the government has had to be dragged through the courts alongside the UK government in order to raise its ambition. But the statement yesterday showed that when the maths in this chamber is finally balanced, then government can open its ears to fresh thinking and is prepared in many areas to be bolder. And that's to be welcomed. And the First Minister talked about a Scotland where an innovation culture thrives, where we're the inventors and manufacturers, not just the consumers, and a Scotland which becomes, in her words, a laboratory for the rest of the world on digital and low-carbon technology. And I think that's an exciting vision, especially for today's digital generations who daily shape the world around them with coded algorithms. A world where the impacts of climate change can be seen right outside of the window. But politics is often defined by tipping points, and some of them big and some of them small. And I think a big tipping point for Scotland would be to set a date for the end of the fossil fuel age. We shouldn't be afraid to choose a date for it, plan for it, and invest in the transition now to take our society and economy to that future place. To hit reverse gear by opening up new risky fossil fuel extraction through fracking would be disastrous and send completely the wrong signal to investors. So we await the Scottish Government decision on fracking with growing expectation in the weeks to come. I'll take a brief intervention, yes. Claudia Beamish. Your microphone, please. Ah, there we go, Claudia. That's not the first time either. <laughs> we, we haven't got Ms. Wimish's microphone yet. You sure it's not your bank card? <laughs> in the, in the, <laughs> I don't want to waste his you're, time. You're, you're on now. You're live. Take your chance. <laughs> Right, to, to ask the member, which, who I hope will get back some time, uh, if he agrees with me that my member's bill could be a way forward um, for, to ban fracking in Scotland, depending on the Scottish Government position. Um, Mark well, Ruskell. I'm happy to confirm that I've signed your member's bill, so I think as part of a belt and braces approach to uh, banning fracking, it's certainly an option that, that could be supported. Of course, the climate bill would be another way to put in a legal uh, ban on fracking as well. Um, if I could move on with a sense of urgency, uh, presiding officer. And, You're making um, up your time. You'll be giving your time for that little palaver. Thank you. Um, palaver. The, the need to call time on the fossil fuel age is the reason why I'll be making the case for a net zero carbon target for 2040 in the forthcoming climate bill. The science tells us we need it. And with a step change uh, closure of Long Gannet that we've seen, we can keep our current pace of carbon cutting action uh, till 2040 and still meet this target. And we needn't feel alone either, with Norway and Sweden, amongst other countries, setting similar targets. And like other countries in the Nordic Arc, Scotland is blessed with the renewable resources to show global leadership, and in so doing, capture the intellectual property and economic advantage that will reward our future generations with well-paid, secure livelihoods. Now, the National Investment Bank that was announced is a welcome new tool to build this future, it could, for example, help de-risk the development of new low-carbon technology and then propel it to commercialization. But it must have sufficient capital and borrowing powers and be aligned closely with the National Transition Plan. So we also welcome the announcement of a Just Transition Commission as the first step towards that, and I hope its membership reflects a wide spectrum that includes political, environmental, public sector, and trade union representatives. Working to this zero carbon target would also provide a strong focus on transport, agriculture and housing sectors, where actions to cut emissions so far have been weak in the government's draft climate plans. If implemented, yesterday's announcements around electric vehicles and active travel will reduce emissions from transport faster than the current climate plan, which is good, but cannot be used as an excuse to dial back on action elsewhere in housing and agriculture. And government spending decisions going forward will have to be aligned with climate targets more closely, especially on national infrastructure projects. 
So it's disappointing that we'll soon enter our third cold winter since the commitment to make energy efficiency a national infrastructure priority, and still without any clarity on how this will be practically delivered. Clearly, bringing homes across the country up to a C rating in energy efficiency would bring a warm glow to 127,000 more homes every year, create thousands of jobs, and save the NHS millions of pounds. Parliament needs a better way to understand not just the carbon in impact of infrastructure projects, but also the carbon impact they create throughout their lifetime. And while we can all marvel at the shiny Queen's Free Crossing, it begs the question about whether Fife is going to see any investment in long-awaited rail infrastructure now we've had that bridge. The Transport Minister's Pipeline of Rail projects is in danger of drying up if funding for economic and technical appraisal work is not forthcoming from either council budgets, the Scottish Government or city re region deals. Showrooms of electric cars presiding officer will be a cold comfort to excluded communities such as Levenmouth if their rail lines remain under weeds. There can be small tipping points too, and I warmly welcome the steps being taken towards a deposit return scheme for Scotland, building on the momentum created by the plastic bag tax. Like the smoking ban, those subtle changes add up to bigger shifts and cultural changes over time. And one of the best ways the government could embed the success of an enhanced budget for walking and cycling would be to make 20 mile an hour the default speed limit on the streets where we live, work and play. The consultation in my bill looks set to have one of the highest responses so far on any legislation proposed this session. And I'll be delighted to share the results and insights with members and officials in the weeks ahead. Presiding officer, this year Green members will continue to ask difficult questions which need urgent answers across the whole government programme while championing bold action that will secure a greener and fairer Scotland. And I look forward to the work ahead. Thank you very much. I call Mike Rumbles to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Mr Rumbles, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity today to focus on the programme for government as it affects our rural economy. But I have to say it would have been good to see the Minister for the Rural Economy in the Chamber today, but he obviously has more important duties to attend to. Without doubt, the last couple of years has seen a re real problems for our rural economy as a result of the complete mishandling of the £500 million European funding, which should have been paid out to our rural businesses on time. Last year, Richard Lockhead failed to deal with this issue adequately, to say the least. It was quite obvious to all concerned that he was unable to manage his department effectively as our farm businesses continue to be denied their funding on time. In comes his successor, Fergus Ewing, full of good intentions, a white knight to the rescue. Indeed, weren't we all impressed in this chamber when in his first speech, after taking over from Richard Lockhead, he apologised to the rural community and said, and I quote, this will not happen again, unquote. It was to be his number one priority to fix. It was an unacceptable situation which was not to be repeated. Well, over one year on, and here we are again. Not only did our rural businesses not receive their funding in December, the 95% figure for payments by the end of June were not reached either. And it's no thanks to our minister that we're, not, we're, we're facing possible sanctions about that from the European Union. In his own defence, because I better say this because he's not here to defend himself, uh, in his own defence, Fergus Ewing is proud of the fact that instead of paying out to our farm businesses their entitlement on time, he organised loans for them from the Scottish Government. And indeed, he paid these loans out ahead of the normal December round. He's very proud of that. The problem here, though, is that our farmers are so worried about the incompetence of the Scottish Government that they were very wary of these loans and the take-up of them has been absolutely dreadful. So dreadful, in fact, that up to £200 million of the £500 million of the money that should have been injected into our rural communities last December went missing because they weren't paid out. This is money our rural communities can ill afford to let go by. My point is that this money, which should have gone to our farm businesses, should have been available to be spent in our rural towns and villages across the country. No, Fergus Ewing's record on this 
his number one priority, is quite frankly lamentable. It's as bad as his predecessors, and there can be no doubt, surely, that the minister's coat should indeed be hanging on a sugarly peg. Yesterday, I listened carefully to the First Minister when she opened this debate on her programme for government. She said absolutely nothing about the problems facing our rural economy. I'll say that again. She said absolutely nothing specifically about the problems facing our rural economy. It didn't fill me with confidence that things for our rural communities right across Scotland are going to get any better over the next year. As soon as the result, for instance, of last year's referendum on Europe, as soon as it became clear to leave the European Union, I argued that the Scottish Government needed, as a matter of urgency, to engage with stakeholders to develop a new strategy for financial support to our farming sector. Indeed, it took until January this year for Fergus Ewing to indicate that he would do this when he accepted my amendment in a debate in this chamber which called for the setting up of a group of experts to develop such a strategy. It turns out, however, that not much is being done. In the event we leave the European Union, the Scottish Government must be ready with a bespoke system of agricultural support tailored to the needs of Scottish farming rather than simply be content to administer the common agricultural policy, a policy designed to aid farming across Europe. Where is the evidence that work is being done to design a bespoke system to meet the needs of Scotland? I would have thought that a nationalist administration, the SNP administration, would be first out of the blocks on this one. But no, we just meander along as usual. When I keep raising this with Fergus Ewing, all he does, all he does is deflect my questioning by attacking the UK government for its lack of clarity on future arrangements. While indeed this lack of clarity is true, it doesn't make up for the fact that there is a complete lack of action on Fergus Ewing's part in designing a new system fit for purpose for Scotland. I would say to the First Minister that has she noticed how lacking in ambition her rural economy minister is? Has she noticed? Is she content, I'm in my last minute, is she content to witness the complete lack of forward thinking demonstrated by Fergus Ewing on the future of agricultural support in Scotland? If she is content, then I can only surmise that she is ignorant of what is required. If this is the best that can be done for our rural economy, then heaven help us. Deputy Presiding Officer, I make no apologies for focusing my time in this debate on the Scottish Government's abject failures in supporting our rural economy. I could have said a lot more on the SNP's other failures, but I just don't have the time. The one thing that could be done now for our rural economy is for Fergus Ewing to actually so sh show some forward thinking and design a bespoke system for the future of agricultural support in Scotland how long do we have to wait? Uh, thank you very much. I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Peter Chapman. Kenneth thank Gibson, you, please. Presiding Officer. And I welcome the First Minister's programme for government and eagerly anticipate its implementation going forward. A programme as robust as the one announced yesterday is key if we are to drive our future in a positive direction. Despite what has obviously been a challenging backdrop, the SNP government is surely to be commended on presiding over the longest period of uninterrupted growth since 2001. And the fundamentals of our economy have proven their strength. The labour market has been increasingly resilient, with employment currently at a record high. The unemployment rate is at 3.2%. And the Chief Economist State of the Economy report uh, uh, said that uh, continued growth, uh, despite headwinds facing various sectors, uh, will continue. Uh, between 2007, when the SNP came into office, and 2015, the value of Scotland's international exports increased from 20 billion to 28.7 billion, a 43.5% uh, increase. And in addition, over the last decade, productivity in Scotland increased by 7.6%, a stark contrast to the 0.4% increase for the UK as a whole. In light of the innovative programme presented yesterday, this positive growth should continue. And I welcome the aim of establishing a Scottish National Investment Bank, which will benefit the public purse 
uh, put public interest before private profit and grant us increased control over economic development. It will also deliver uh, a boost to our business environment and entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, this is essential, of course, to the good health of Scotland's economy, helping provide our businesses, uh, the number of which is now at a record high, with capital for investment. Uh, commenting on the programme for government, uh, Scottish Council for Development and Industry Chief uh, Executive Mark Bevan said, and I quote, Scotland faces massive challenges to the established economic consensus and we need high level strategic action to meet them head on. We need a relentless government focused on the long term future economy and a greater cooperative political response to deliver that focus. In that context, we are pleased to see the First Minister highlighting specific measures that will help, such as investment in R&D and the creation of an, a Scottish National Investment Bank. Part of this fresh vision for the government encourages Scotland to aspire to full participation in an increasingly digital world. Significant progress towards this goal has already been achieved as business research and development rose 41% in real terms between 2007 and 2015. The additional £45 million in R&D support from enterprise agencies announced uh, is expected to unlock a further £270 million of R&D expenditure. Ensuring Scotland is in a position to lead by example when it comes to the digital technology and innovation that holds a key to a prosperous future. Presiding officer, technology transforms the way we live our lives, connecting us in new and innovative ways. It creates a platform and momentum for innovation. Soon, no sector of business or individual will be immune to the far-reaching influence of artificial intelligence. Computers with the ability to sense their surroundings, think, learn and take action. AI sets itself apart from the automation of routine tasks. Science fiction may often portray AI in the form of robots with human-like characteristics, but this broad spectrum encompasses all manner of technologies. In line with the most recent digital strategy for Scotland, the SNP government is looking to ensure that Scotland is recognised throughout the world as a vibrant, inclusive, open and outward-looking digital nation, promoting healthy and open discussion surrounding our, our country's relationship with AI constitutes a topical part of this strategy. And according to PwC report, ec The Economic Impact of Artificial Intelligence on the UK Economy, published in June, AI has the potential to boost Scotland's annual income by up to £16,700 million by 2030. This figure represents the equivalent of an annual £3,000 per person, although productivity gains, uh, through productivity gains, new business investment and product improvement. This requires new industries to supply and service new automated solutions, thus contributing to net employment growth. And AI could allow Scotland to reap numerous benefits across the board, including greater prosperity and more individual leisure time. And Scotland is already well placed to benefit from the shift towards AI, thanks to strong foundations in the technology. <coughs> Startups in different industries such as healthcare, cyber security, insurance and finance are helping propel our country forward and drive uh, innovation. In terms of activity which stimulates economic activity while also protect the environment, I commend the government's continued commitment to the circular economy, one of renewed importance which seeks new ways to reduce our toll over natural resources and keeps materials flowing through the economy at as high a value as possible for as long as possible. As such, the introduction of a deposit return scheme for cans and bottles is both welcome and necessary, especially considering the fact that only 47-52% of plastic drinks bottles are currently recycled, and that the introduction of this scheme presents a potential reduction of 10 to 40 million in the costs litter pollution imposes on society. The introduction of this scheme, along with the commitment to increase the number of electric and ultra-low uh, commission vehicles, uh, will uh, continue Scotland on our path to a low carbon future and I'm sure we're all looking forward to the abolition of the sale of uh, non-electric vehicles um, from 2032 or fossil fuel vehicles from 2032 um, not being sold. Low carbon initiatives will in turn support an employment market. 21,000 jobs are supported directly by the low carbon renewable energy economy in Scotland representing 9.1% of UK employment in this sector reinforcing the overall importance of, uh, of building on those industries. Unsurprisingly, Brexit presents a significant yet unavoidable risk to business uh, in Scotland with investment sensitive to changing market signals and the as yet unclear structure uh, also represents the greatest uh, source of uncertainty for our economy, particularly beyond 2018 as negotiations progress. While these challenges must and will be addressed, within them lie significant opportunities, not only in terms of improving our economy and environment, but across the board. The combination of positive progress by this government and the refreshing, ambitious content of the new programme outlined yesterday reinforces the faith I have in the Scottish Government to seize and build on these opportunities. 
Presiding officer, following the snap general election, we face a Tory government at Westminster propped up by the DUP in Scotland, subject to continuing budget cuts, subjecting us to continued budget cuts whilst Tory MSPs demand lower taxes, a doubling of the house building programme despite Brexit exacerbating skill shortages, and more money for every portfolio, as no doubt we'll witness at budget time. Uh, as was made clear earlier today uh, when Dean Lockhart was uh, caught out by the Finance Secretary and made no apology for the £2.9 billion the Tory government has cut from Scotland's budget, uh, they have no answers. And with Labour's next leader likely to be a former MP who voted on the 13th of January 2015 in the House of Commons for £30,000 million of budget cuts, it's clear that an anti-austerity progressive economic strategy will be advanced only by this SNP government. Thank you. I now call Peter Chapman to be followed by Graham Day. Mr Chapman, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I refer members to my register of interests relating to farming. At the end of our summer term, the First Minister promised a bold and radical relaunch. My goodness, it was badly needed. Because as, as out of 13 bills promised in the 2016 prog programme for government, only three were passed. In comparison, the 2011 government had passed nine bills in its first year. So I, I, I realise that this is a poor, poor government. Only a year in, but it has no energy, it has no vision, it lacks talent and it is failing Scotland. Let's talk about farming. Somebody needs to, as it wasn't mentioned once in the First Minister's 35-minute speech yesterday. We were assured by the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing, and had hoped he would be here today, that lessons had been learned and there must be no repeat of the unacceptable cap payments problem of 2015-16. Yet, here we are in September, and 481 farmers still await basic payment scheme payments due last December. And now we in Scotland only paid 90% of BPS payments by the end of June deadline, yet England and Wales managed 99%. Mm. Our problems are all due to a 178 million IT programme, which is of poor quality, incomplete, not capable of doing the job, and which may not fully work until 2018. And if there is any doubt that payments will be delayed again this year, a loan scheme must be put in place at once. Farming incomes across Scotland have plummeted and we cannot have another year of payment delays. Average incomes have fallen by 75% in the last five years and by 48% in the last year alone to a completely unsustainable average of just £12,600 per farming business. And that is after receiving cap payments. And this means that, that leaving many farming families in despair and unable to pay their bills. Now, with this in mind, what has the Scottish Government planned in its revision of the Scottish Rural Development Programme? I will tell you, a cut in funding by tens of millions of pounds. Less favoured area scheme is being cut by 40 million pounds and the environment and climate change schemes are being cut by 42 million pounds. This only backs up claims that the SNP have turned their back on the farming community and why it did not feature once in the programme for government. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the future for the, of the fishing industry in Scotland, not a mention either. Not a mention of fishing. I will. Mr Rumbles. Farming businesses themselves that when they receive this support but it's the money that is spent in our villages and towns and our filling stations and the corner shops that are, this, this lack of finance affects the whole of the rural economy. Mr that, Chapman. That is absolutely correct. You know, farmers are the best in the world for paying, paying out money. We, we spend money even if we don't have it sometimes, but that is absolutely correct. Any money that comes into the rural economy, into the farming business, is immediately spent in the local economy, and that's what keeps many local economies going, and we forget that at our peril. We've only done one. So, no, not now. When it comes to fishing, not a mention either. And any enthusiasm, and we see no enthusiasm from the SNP regarding the opportunities leaving the AU, EU may bring. The SNP continually shout 
that the Westminster government is planning a so-called power grab. Yet we have been absolutely clear that after Brexit, Holyrood will have more power. When will the SNP start to work positively and support the process of getting the best possible deal and stop using this process as a means of berating and criticising the Westminster Government? I will. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, can I thank Peter Champman for taking the intervention? And given that he just said that after this process has been gone through, troubling though it will be, we will have more powers, can you tell us what one of those powers will be? Mr I, Chapman. I, 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 I am not in the, in the heart of the Westminster government, and I won't. <laughs> Listen, you have been assured on every occasion that there will be at least the same amount of powers, if not more. And I am just standing here now saying there will be more powers to the Scottish government. The, this tactic, and this tactic, this spoiling tactic, means they are making a good deal for the whole of the UK much more difficult. Instead of being positive about the sea of opportunity for the fishing industry after Brexit, Fergus Ewing's announcement of plans that Scottish trawlers would suffer a quota cut if a certain percentage of their fish were not landed in the UK is completely the wrong approach. We all want to see the maximum amount of fish landed and processed here. However, the Scottish Government should not be trying to micromanage and browbeat our fishermen, but should be helping processors increase capacity and, 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 and market more effectively, thus making landing here more attractive. At present, Scottish pelagic fishermen have no option but to land some of their catch in Norway, as there is not enough capacity here. Norway not only have more pelagic fish processing capacity, but they also have income guarantee schemes in place and they generally pay higher prices. I will. Claire Adamson. Of how much Norway relies on the free movement of people to actually have the workers to process that fish? Could you repeat that, please? Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder if the member is aware of how much Norway relies on the free movement of people to um, actually um, provide the workers to process that fish in Norway? Mr Chapman. We are, we, they are in, in the same position as we are as far as needing uh, EU workers into this country. And we have said we, EU workers in this country are absolutely welcome to be here. And uh, EU workers who are here are, are, are welcome to stay. And we have no problem with that whatsoever. Fergus Ewing should start working with the industry instead of trying to bully them. Now, at a more local level, nearly 30% of the casework my office has received in the last six months have been health and social related issues. Constituents in my area are suffering from both physical health and men mental health waiting times. Getting to GP facilities in rural areas has often been difficult, but with lack of staff and practice closure, it has become nearly a nearly impossible task for some people in the Northeast. Presiding officer, this SNP government is failing Scotland, neglecting key industries like fishing and farming, and needs to raise its game. If this SNP government cannot give the lead, the direction and the good government Scotland needs, then we in the Conservative benches will highlight that and hold them to, to account at every opportunity. That is our promise, and that is exactly what we will do. Thank you. I call, Graham, I call Graham Day to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Mr Day, please. Presiding officer, I view yesterday's programme for government announcement from a couple of perspectives. Firstly, as a constituency MSP, looking at how the proposals contained within it would impact the everyday life of my constituents. And secondly, as convener of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, considering, amongst other things, the work streams it would generate for that committee. I was left enthused in both regards. Time won't permit me to explore the potential impacts of the wider measures on my Angus South constituency. And this afternoon is a session looking specifically at economy and environment. So I want to focus my contribution on the environmental aspect of the programme for government. Presiding officer, the response from the opposition benches to the statement, Mark Ruskell apart perhaps, has been depressingly predictable. There's wee bits we like, but we're mostly going to spend our time knocking the content and the record of the government. Now, I accept that I'm likely from those same quarters to be accused in turn of taking a glass three quarters full of you. So let's look at what those of an unbiased and informed perspective had to say about the environmental element of what was announced. Eric Solheim, head of UN Environment, 
Great leadership and commitments on climate, emissions, clean air, pollution, circular economy and plastic waste from Nicola Sturgeon. Scotland to phase out petrol and diesel vehicles. Another breath of, breath of fresh air. Friends of the Earth Scotland, the greenest programme for government in the history of the Scottish Parliament. Greenpeace, this is what real leadership looks like. WWF Scotland, the benefits of today's announcement will continue to be felt across Scotland for generations to come. Absolutely. Uh, Graeme Dave, Liam, take the intervention. Li oh. <laughs> I'll get it out. Liam Kerr, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, look, despite repeated pleas, the Cabinet Secretary has so far failed to show the leadership to commit funding to deal with coastal erosion at Montrose, just outside Graeme Day's constituency, uh, which will lead to flooding. So will he push for the Scottish Government to change that stance and deal with the environmental problem on our doorstep? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's Graeme an interesting Day. point because coastal erosion is co caused largely by climate change. That is what all these measures are designed to tackle. There is a bigger picture issue here. And let's look at the detail of the measures which have attracted such a positive response from those possessing an objective perspective. Direct early stage support for the ACORN project at St Fergus, both welcome and necessary given the reliance placed on carbon capture and storage in the draft climate plan. A small sum of money, yes, but a measure which hopefully will give the UK government the push needed to get things moving again. The commitment to deliver low emission zones in our four largest cities by 2020 and all other air quality management areas where necessary by 2023. Both matters of importance highlighted in its work by the Environment Committee. I also welcome the creation of a research programme on blue carbon and options for deep sea national marine reserves. And the commitment of £500,000 to begin addressing litter sinks around our coast and develop policy to address marine plastics. And on land reform, I'm looking forward to the exploration by the Land Commission of ownership of land by charitable trusts, land banking and how common good assets are used and where that might lead us. Then there's a big ticket stuff, such as the introduction of a deposit return scheme, an issue championed by my colleague Richard Lockhead and progressed on behalf of the committee by a subgroup headed by our former deputy convener, Morris Golden. The extensive scoping work carried out by the subgroup highlighted both the challenges as well as the undoubted potential of a DRS scheme. And I very much welcome the modelling currently being undertaken by the government to determine the type of scheme likeliest to work best for Scotland. Because this isn't just as simple as committing to the principle and charging ahead. If we look at the kind of plastic bottles likely to be captured by a DRS scheme, current collection rates across the UK, the rate across the UK, that is, is circa 60%. But that's variable, with Wales, for example, hitting 75%. The performance levels of DRS schemes as introduced elsewhere vary from 50% to 90%. So it's right that the government takes these next few months to identify the scheme best suited to our circumstances and how any pinch points can be addressed. There is resistance out there, but many, in fact the vast majority of the legitimate concerns, for example in relation to smaller retails, can be addressed by drawing on practical applications from other places, not least of all Estonia. The other major announcement, of course, concerned the commitment to phase out new petrol and diesel cars and vans by 2032. And sitting alongside that, extending the Green Bus Fund and massively expanding the number of electric charging points in rural, urban and domestic settings. The Scottish Green Bus Fund has so far assisted with the purchase of 350 low carbon emission buses across Scotland. 25 of those operate within my constituency. And across Angus South, we're also seeing new charging points to other than Kirrimuir, Carnoustie, Arbroath and Monny Feath. However, the move away from environmentally damaging forms of transport will only deliver in full if we have low emission vehicles powered from a grid increasingly supplied by clean, green energy. And we have a couple of hurdles to overcome in that regard, neither of this government's making. Yesterday during the opening speeches, Willie Rennie claimed offshore re renewable energy, with its enormous potential to contribute, was lagging behind. He's right, certainly in terms of wind, but let's look at why. Renewable energy generation is at an all-time high, and this SNP government sought to build on that by consenting four offshore wind farms in the first of Forth and Tay. Massive infrastructure projects with enormous economic and environmental potential. But only one of those, NNG, has attracted contract for difference backing. So the UK government has to step up here when the next round of CFD comes forward. That's not a political point, that's a fact. And just as we need Westminster to do its bit, we also need elements of Scotland's environmental lobby, not only to talk the talk on tackling climate change, but walk the walk. Because even if all four of these wind farms had subsidy to match consent, 
there still wouldn't be a single turbine being built, let alone installed, because a member organization of Stock Climate Chaos, the RSPB, is continuing its efforts to wreck these projects. So can I say to Willie Rennie, if he's listening, that I hope he'll join me, because we both have a constituency interest in the Firth of Forth and TRAs, in urging the UK government and the RSPB to get behind them and clear the way for the environmental and economic benefit they'll provide Scotland. Presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Day. I call Polly McNeill, followed by Gail Ross. Ms. McNeill, please. Thank you. Housing must, mu housing must be much higher up the agenda of this parliament. The period since the financial crash has meant that more people are struggling to get on the housing ladder, that the social sector has shrunk dramatically, and that has resulted in a tripling of the private sector. The term generation rent describes the current story on housing. And essentially it means that many are trapped into the private sector, not through choice, and the lack of housing supply are pushing up rents. Housing should be regarded as central to the health and welfare of every individual, and it should be a right to live in a warm home with an affordable rent or mortgage. It must be a central area of action for this programme for government. The house building industry believes that housing should be treated as a national infrastructure project, and I agree with that. It should have a level of priority and a serious role in creating jobs and skills. We need a new strategy on homelessness. Statistics from Glasgow City Mission and the Bethany Trust show that rough sleeping is on the rise in the last two years. I welcome what the First Minister said yesterday, that the government will set out clear and national objectives to eradicate rough sleeping. But it must be a priority for this government. Homeless applications by those with mental health problems and disability are on the rise. But housing increasingly signifies the divisions in society of inequality, of the have and the have nots. We are in a crisis now with a severe housing shortage of social housing. We have rising rents. And while wages have been flatlining over the last decade, and not to mention the huge barrier to home ownership, you can begin to see the problem. Can there seriously now be any question as to whether or not that housing should be a cabinet post and not a junior post in this government? The First Minister herself must show, yes, the First Minister herself must show that the housing sector, she must show to the housing sector that she understands and cares about housing as a policy area and a central part of our government's programme. I give way to Derek Mackay. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Pauline McNeill for taking the intervention? And I, ho I hope and believe that many others do share that commitment uh, that uh, housing should be a priority. Does the member therefore welcome the resource planning assumptions that I have uh, announced with the uh, Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance that amount to one and three quarter billion pounds over the resource planning period to build houses across Scotland? Polly McNeill. I have absolutely no difficulty whatsoever in welcoming the resource allocation and the ambition to build 50,000 houses, but, and I'll come to that. But I do genuinely think, when it was a cabinet position in the last government, and I think it's really about time um, that it was brought back into the cabinet to demonstrate how important the area of housing is. But I want to set out why I think housing policy needs to shift up the agenda. It was one of the many reasons, reasons that housing has been more prominent recently is the tragedy of the Grenfell Tower fire. It has opened our eyes up to the fact that it is the poorest people who end up in the least safe housing and that they have the least access to challenge bad decisions made by those landlords who put profit over safety. Making housing affordable must be a priority to take people out of poverty. Housing costs push many into poverty. 320,000 Scots were in work, in work poverty before housing costs. 
And that rises by another 100,000 if you take that after housing costs. The poverty rate for young adults was higher in 2014 than any other age group. Young people are overrepresented in the least wealthy households. And the average level of debt for young people has almost doubled and has done so twice as fast as other age groups. The Institute of Fiscal Studies analysis has shown that wealth has been significantly distributed away from young people and that this has been driven by a reduction in home ownership. That essentially means that the baby boomer generation are 50% more likely to own their own homes at age 30 than the millennials. High levels of deposit and low wage growth have meant that it's far harder to get a mortgage. It is this age group, the, six, the age 16 to 29, that needs a more radical government policy to prevent further intergenerational inequality. Poorer young people who don't have the bank of mum and dad must be helped. The Help to Buy scheme is due to end in 2019 and I asked the government this afternoon if and when we can have a commitment that that important scheme will continue beyond that date. I think it is important to give confidence to prospective young people, in fact any families and the industry itself in knowing that there will be help to buy. But the help to buy scheme must also help those on the lowest wages and it might be worthwhile having a review of the scheme itself to ensure that it does that. According to the Scottish Household Survey, social housing tenure is down to 23% of the total tenure it previously was 32%. And according to Shelter, almost half a billion pounds a year of government money goes to private landlords in housing benefit. It's quite a staggering figure. It is a large state subsidy. And we should demand high standards for tenants in the private sector. And as has been said before, that should include a C rating for energy efficiency to match the social sector. I'm sorry, I must ask you to conclude there, Ms McNeill. Thank you. I call Gail Ross to be followed by Edwin Mountain. Ms Ross, please. Thank you, President Officer. Next week, my constituency of Caithness, Sutherland and Ross has the honour of hosting a fantastic group of young people from Sunnyside Primary School in Easterhouse, Glasgow, a group who call themselves the Ocean Defenders. This group of dedicated children have made it their mission to raise money and awareness of marine issues and have been supporting the work of organisations based in Ullapool and Wester Ross. Next week, they will have the opportunity to come to the area experience the incredible environment, spend time with their peers from rural schools and learn more about the nature and habitats of that particular part of Scotland. These children have decided their own path for their learning and development and that path leads to the spectacular beauty of the West Coast. They have built new relationships, not only with each other and with their new friends in West Ross, but also with their surroundings. Today, children from all across Scotland, and in particular the Ocean Defenders in Sunnyside Primary, are learning, experiencing and developing, all because of the fantastic opportunities that they have to access and research their natural world. The Chamber won't be surprised to hear that I welcome the announcements from the Scottish Government on the plans for the environment and the low carbon economy. This has been described by Friends of the Earth as the greenest programme for government in the history of the Scottish Parliament, and it needed to be. We already have some world-beating aspirations. Scotland has one of the most ambitious targets in Europe to reduce food waste. Scotland has targets to recycle 70% of all household waste by 2025. Scotland's first separate <coughs> air quality strategy was published in 2015. Our target for renewable energy in Scotland is to generate the equivalent of 100% of gross electricity by an 11% of heat consumption by 2020. And last year, we reached our emissions target six years earlier than planned. But we all agree we can do more. More to encourage Scotland's youth to be active and responsible citizens towards the world we live in, and so much more to preserve our beautiful nation for generations to come. And as members before me, I'd like to draw attention to just a few of the policies that are contained in the programme for government 
and how I believe these are vital to ensure our environment is enriched and protected now and in the future. The Scottish Government has announced a plan to develop a deposit return scheme for bottles and cans. According to the WWF, four out of five members of the public support this and deposit return systems are already working well in other countries that present similar challenges. Canada, Australia, America, Estonia, Germany and Norway, amongst others. But alongside this, a complete change in public behaviour is also needed to curb littering. Whilst I appreciate that we have come a long way in terms of recycling in Scotland in the lifetime of this Parliament, and as I said previously, we have laudable targets, littering, particularly of drinks containers, remains a worrying issue. Starting now, we will be bringing up generations of children who will see returning drinks containers as, no as a normal, everyday occurrence. And speaking of culture change, not only from an education point of view, but also from a health and well-being point of view, we do need to do more to move towards active journeys. And the announcement yesterday that the Scottish Government plans to double investment in walking and cycling to £80 million a year will go a long way to cutting carbon emissions and shows real investment in a low-carbon economy. Another aim is that of decarbonising <coughs> our transport sector by 2032. In my constituency, journeys can be extremely lengthy and active travel is just not practical in some cases. Here's an example. And now that I'm reading it back, I'm not sure if it's a very good example, but I'll say it anyway. When my constituents in Laid need to do their weekly shopping, not that many people do their weekly shopping on a bicycle, but a round trip is just under six hours, traveling over 200 miles. So on that note, the Scottish Government's commitment to ultra-low emission vehicles in this programme is also to be welcomed. And, as an economic... Yes? Liam Kerr. Rural drivers, I think, will be very concerned at uh, the move away from diesel transport, uh, particularly those in rural communities such as your own. Um, can the member tell me, is the Scottish Government committed to having adequate numbers of charging points by 2032? If so, what is the projected cost of that and where is the money coming from? I'm glad that Liam Kerr brought that point up. As he knows, I am not a member of the Scottish Government, so I can't price that for him. But I am getting on to where we're going with charging points, if he would let me continue. Thank you. <laughs> As an economic opportunity, AGM Batteries Limited runs the UK's largest lithium-ion cell manufacturing plant, and they are based in Thurso, in my constituency. Yeah. Infrastructure will need to be put in place on routes all over the country to allow this to become a reality. And I relish the opportunity, alongside all of my colleagues, cross-party in the chamber, of working with the communities in my constituency to ensure that they have equitable access to ultra-low emissions infrastructure. And the A9, which runs from Perth to Scrabster, is due to be an electric highway. And may I suggest that the NC500 should be next. Presiding officer, future generations of Scots deserve to live in a clean, healthy, beautiful country, a country to be proud of, and which has an active and vital role to play in combating climate change, which is all too real. And these policies announced yesterday recognise the vital importance of our natural environment and a low carbon economy, not only to our nation in the future, but to our children of today. I welcome them wholeheartedly and look forward to see how they will be embedded in either legislation or national plans and in time become a part of normal life. And I'm sorry, I forgot to say at the start that I am also a PLO to the First Minister. Thank you. Saved yourself at the last gasp. Uh, call Edward Mountain, followed by Stuart McMillan. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and to save myself at the first gasps, I am going to refer members to my register of interests. The Scottish legislative list looks a little more extensive this year than last year's rather slim picking, pickings. What is clear, though, is there's not much for the rural economy, and I'm saddened by this lack of vision. This is especially surprising, as last year, when it came to rural issues, it was probably not one that the government or indeed Mr Ewing, who sadly isn't here, will want to remember. In fact, it's not like the year before that they wouldn't have wanted to remember, or the year before that. 
I believe that this government has missed an opportunity to bring forward ideas to help the farming industry to start to come forward to the terms of Brexit. Perhaps that's not surprising, as the ideas that they have come forward with, such as the beef efficiency scheme, has fallen flat, with almost 20% of beef producers who originally signed up to it walking away from it, saying that it's turned out to be an administrative nightmare. So if this government can't come up with ideas for farmers in the agricultural sector, perhaps they should encourage those farmers and the agriculture sector to take a lead on improvement themselves, as they do in, in places such as Canada. At least that this would mean that government would be absolved from being blamed for the poorly delivered and poorly dis, uh, conceived schemes that they've designed themselves. Now, as there are no new ideas for legislation for rural issues in the government programme, perhaps I can offer some tips on what they should be doing. And I, again, I, I just reiterate, I, it's sad that Mr Ewing isn't here because these perhaps are directed slightly at him. Firstly, if you continually say, we are sorry and we are fixing it, for goodness sake, make sure you do fix it. You might be sorry for your farm payment fiasco, but you sure as hell... Uh, sorry, sure surely have not fixed it. I apologise, presiding officer. It's gently recovered, gently recovered. <laughs> it still rumbles on. Frankly, it's clear we would have been better off to buy an off-the-shelf computer to run the Scottish Farm Payment Scheme instead of investing the 178 million in a failed system which cost a significant sum more to run each year than the off-the-peg system was projected to. Secondly, if you believe, as I do, that Scotland's fishermen are a vital part of our economy, I suggest you might like to do less to alienate them. They want to revive their industry and see taking back control from the EU as a way of doing this. Looking at the SNP's programme for government, I see little to give them confidence. It seems that this government is, is set on antagonising them. Pelagic fishermen are rightly incensed at suggestions of plans to reduce their quota of Scottish trawlers if they don't land at least 55% of their catch in Scotland. That is not an open market. It's more like a restricted market that could cost our fishermen and the economy dear as they will be prohibited from selling their fish at the best advantage. Well, actually, I want to just push on, and I, and I feel you're going to come back to me at a later stage, but we'll see. And when it comes to the fishing industry... What happened to the inshore fisheries bill? A promise delayed or a promise undelivered? Now I want to mention what I perceive are two huge missed opportunities, both to do with connecting and enhancing communications. I did hope that this programme for government might bring forward a plan to accelerate delivery of broadband to all before 2021. That would have been welcomed by all, but nothing, silence. Frankly, a bit like broadband in rural areas. I, I will take, it, I will take a, 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 an intervention. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. Um, is the member aware that broadband in large parts of digital is actually the responsibility of the UK government? But indeed, their failure to act has meant that the Scottish, gover Scottish government is going even further to deliver access for Scotland. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Of, co of course... You know, if it's happening on your watch and you're not going to deliver it, you will, of course, try and slope shoulders. But there is scope to accelerate delivery, and bringing the rollout forward and giving it to the rural economy will boost it in a way it desperately needs. During the summer, I've met constituents and businesses from Tongue to Portree, from Kinloch Burby to Granton, all who bemoan the lack of broadband. Let me share a specific example with you. A business that employs 140 people at peak time and ships 640 lorry loads of produce all over the UK, has such poor broadband, they have to go to Inverness to email their shipping notes and check their orders for the next day. They are hamstrung by the lack of high-speed broadband. Let me be clear. More connectivity would be clearly delivering for Scotland and ensuring that businesses grow. More jobs, more income, more growth, and without, Dutch, without doubt, cross-party support. Oh, uh, of course, I will take an interview. Stuart seems in, but you're in your last minute, Mr. Mountain, so it's up to you. Uh, noting oh. that the UK government has legislated for a broadband speed of 10 megabits per second, will he congratulate the Scottish government on its 
30 megabits per second program that we are undertaking to deliver broadband to every inhabited premise in Scotland. Briefly, Mr Mountain. I'll, of course, congratulate anyone when they deliver it. It's delivery that counts. <laughs> Not delivered yet. So, presiding officer, as you are uh, suggesting my time is nearly up, when it comes to, to, to believe that... Sorry, when it comes to rural issues, I believe this 10-year-old government has little ambition. They know they have lost confidence for those that live in the rural areas. They lack the drive to bring forward the delivery of policies for farmers, fishermen and business. And I believe that this government is holding back rural Scotland. Let me be clear, no business that showed this lack of vision and drive would survive. When time gets hard, it's time to not to be timid, it's time to be visionary and show leadership. Thank I you. You must, now, you must now conclude. Thank I you. I see a government that has withdrawn into what it believes Conclude, its comfort zone, please. The Thank, zone. You. Thank you. I call Stuart McMillan, followed by Richard Leonard. Mr McMillan. Thank you very much, Mr. Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I warmly welcome this programme for government. And there's lots in it that the Chamber can unite and support, as was evident in some of the contributions from yesterday. From the welcome of the introduction of Frank's Law, uh, the new drug driving offence, which uh, contrary to uh, Ruth Davidson's false claims yesterday, I had actually raised the issue with the Scottish Government in the first instance in June of 2016. Uh, to the removal of the 1% pay cap for public sector workers, the introduction of the investment bank, the deposit and return scheme and the sanitary products initiative to deal with period poverty, to name just six examples. This programme is bursting with proposals and ideas that will actually help and shape our country for the future. These six examples also uh, provide real differences to our country, our communities, our environment and also to our individual uh, constituencies. And I want to touch upon just a few of the examples from yesterday which will help our communities and our constituents. The drug driving offence is one uh, that I generally am pleased uh, to see. Uh, the government came under some criticism earlier in the year uh, about the lack of this as an offence. Uh, but uh, it was clear that whilst the UK government had provided a focus on drug driving offences, the Scottish government had actually focused on attacking and tackling drink driving offences. The introduction of this new offence will certainly go some way to making our roads safer and I'm sure many of our constituents will be pleased that this offence is to be introduced. Next I'll touch upon the deposit and return scheme. In 1995, uh, when I was studying in Germany, the scheme was already in operation in terms of glass bottles, and I know that similar schemes took place in some of the Scandinavian countries. But I'm delighted that this scheme is now going to happen here in Scotland. And it, uh, certainly, it will have environmental and also economic benefits, and its reach will actually enter into many areas of our economy. Now, clearly, uh, our important wildlife environment uh, will benefit, and the wildlife tourism market will certainly be a beneficiary, but so too will marine tourism. Marine tourism is already a growing and in, uh, economy and it's also encouraging more people to participate uh, in our waters. Our coastline is already uh, renowned for its beauty and it's also a magnet for people taking part in marine-based activities. And if our coastline becomes even cleaner, that may actually encourage even more people to take part in outdoor activities, including marine-based activities. And the economic effect of this policy will bring greater economic rewards than just the main environmental rewards, uh, although they are extremely important. Sure. Claudia Beamish. For taking intervention and uh, wonder if he agrees with me that one of the economic benefits will be the possibilities for the circular economy of remanufacturing the plastic in, and bringing new jobs to uh, often fragile rural communities, but um, communities across Scotland. Stuart McMillan. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I think certainly that is an opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, certainly, uh, when members consider uh, the, the economic benefits of the, the environmental proposals in the programme, then I'm sure that, that more members in the Chamber can see the ambition uh, to make Scotland a greener and more economically sustainable nation. Putting Scotland at the forefront of a low-carbon future is actually vital for our economic opportunity and also potential. The presenting officer, the usual politicking, it has taken place already in this debate yesterday and also some of it today, which is to be expected. Now, Dean uh, Lockhart, uh, in his contribution earlier on, he, 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 st he stated low growth and low wage economy. But certainly, regarding the, the low wage aspect, surely Mr Lockhart, uh, he sadly left the chamber, surely Mr Lockhart would also realise that employment law actually rests with his colleagues in Westminster. Therefore, his colleagues in the Scot Scotland office might want to raise this 
and also has concerns with his government colleagues. Now, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance today indicated uh, <coughs> in, in the questions earlier on that pending parliamentary approval, there will be a statement on the, the Bartley Review next week. Now, the review has been helpful in the economic debate and, uh, and I certainly look forward to the statement uh, next Tuesday if, if we all agree on it to take place. But uh, I know certainly uh, businesses locally, both in the marine tourism and also the nursery provision sectors, have raised issues with me in recent months and it's, I've had some correspondence with the Cabinet Secretary on that note. But listening to the continual negativity uh, from the Tories, but equally depressing and inevitability uh, of, their, of their comments. However, I think even the Tories need to listen to some of the comments made by others about this programme for government. Now, Madeleine Cuff, the Deputy Editor of Business Green, has stated, genuinely blown away by the scale of ambition here. And Hugh Aitken, the CBI Scotland Director, overall, the First Minister's focus on the economy will be welcomed by business. Amidst the challenges of Brexit, it is more important than ever to concentrate on building a competitive pro-enterprise business environment that not only delivers more jobs and greater prosperity, but it is more resilient and represents an increasingly attractive destination for investment. Now, presiding officer, not even the Tories could actually attempt to claim that the CBI Scotland are SNP flag wavers. Presiding officer, this programme for government is big on ambition and ideas and it will deliver a better Scotland. The elephant in the room, however, is the, is the utter shambles of the Brexit process led by the hapless and hopeless in Whitehall. The early signs of the Brexit negotiations are not good and the Tories are in, are in complete denial about the mess that their government is presiding over. The reports today about the leaked document affecting EU workers once again highlights the UKIP wing of the Tories is firmly in charge at the moment. And certainly Peter Chapman's comments regarding uh, the fishing industry uh, earlier on I certainly can indicate that. Presiding officer, I welcome the programme for government. And I know that my constituency of Greenock and Inverclyde will benefit. And I'm sure many of my constituents will, will be delighted with this programme also. And I, I know that certainly this programme is bursting with ambition and ideas to make Scotland a cleaner and fairer and better, and better country going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr McMillan. I call Richard Leonard to be followed by Claire Adams. And Mr Leonard, please. Thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Scottish Labour Party publishes its industrial strategy in the first week of recess, and the SNP First Minister then makes a speech in the last week of recess in which she borrows much of the Labour Party's language, a bit of our analysis, and some but not all of the Labour Party's solutions. And it turns up again a few days later in yesterday's programme for government. But there were some important differences. In her speech last week, the First Minister spoke of growing employee-owned businesses, including, I hope, workers' cooperatives. That was not mentioned yesterday. She spoke last week as well of a new partnership between government and the public sector and business. This was also missing yesterday. Of course, supporting business research and development, including the Scottish Enterprise Budget for Business R&D, which, as I exposed just two weeks ago, was being so overrun with claims and so underfunded with cash that the senior manager for innovation and enterprise at Scottish Enterprise was forced to send an internal memo in which she said, and I quote, the practice of making upfront payments must cease, holding back payments on new smart R&D until the next financial year was necessary. So we welcome the decision to increase the budget for this item from £22 million a year to £37 million a year, but I'm bound to ask this, how much of this additional £15 million is already committed? And is the practice of upfront awards especially critical for our small and medium-sized enterprises still off the table or is it back on the table? And when the South of Scotland interim board is established, where will its budget come from? Is there to be additional money or is it simply a case of cutting resources from already existing and stretched Scottish enterprise budgets. What of the Scottish National Investment Bank? Of course we welcome this outline proposal. It is, after all, a straight lift from the Scottish Labour Party's industrial strategy. But how will the bank be governed? Will it have a board of 50% women and 50% men? What about the role of trade unions in its work? And if there is to be a just transition commission, 
Where will the trade union and community voice be on that? Because whilst we support unreservedly action to tackle climate change, we cannot leave workers or entire communities behind, which is why we have repeatedly argued that we need a little bit more economic planning and a little bit less market in the climate change plan of this government. On the broader front, of course we welcome a debate about tax taxation. Of course we welcome the lifting of the public sector pay cap. This has been a long-standing demand of the entire trade union movement, including Labour in this parliament. I will take an intervention. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I wonder if Richard Leonard could tell us then why the Labour Party in Wales doesn't support lifting the public sector pay cap. I know that Labour Party doesn't want to acknowledge the fact it's in government in Wales on these islands, but perhaps you could give us the rationale behind that. Richard Leonard. Uh, I'm a Labour member of the Scottish Parliament, here to, hold to a, here to hold to account the Scottish SNP government. It's an answer government which appears to be in office but not in power. It's failed to tackle the deep and underlying problems we face. So listen to 260,000 children in Scotland, 40,000 more than last year, are now living in poverty. No wonder the educational attainment gap is getting worse. And the number of people working but still considered to be living in poverty is at its worst point since devolution last winter. Half of our pensioners lived in fuel poverty. We have a government that has failed to tackle our housing crisis, failed to tackle our national shame of health inequality. The huge cuts year on year to local government with the impact on local services has of course simply made that inequality worse. Deputy Presiding Officer, this government has also failed to tackle the crisis in social care and presided over worsening mental health services especially for our young people. They have failed to meet their own treatment time guarantees and discharge targets. And now we face an impending crisis in doctor surgeries right across the country. How on earth can we hope to tackle these issues of fundamental importance if the SNP won't even acknowledge they exist, let alone try to solve them? Their flagship policy in education, a de facto Tory bill, will take more power from local government, something opposed by teachers and parents alike. So it is a programme for government which is not radical but reactionary. It shows that only Labour can deliver the investment and the ideas to deliver real change. The real and radical change that is needed, only Labour will properly redistribute income to ensure we look after the many, not the few. Only Labour will properly invest in our economy and create the work that people need. Only, only Labour offers hope for a new society. Only Labour has a plan for our public services and public sector workers. Only Labour has a plan for our pensioners. Only Labour has a plan for our sick who are fed up of waiting to be seen. Only Labour can deliver the real and radical change the people of Scotland need. It's time to end the decade of complacency. I call... I call Claire Adamson to be followed by Donald Cameron. Ms. Ad, if I could have, uh, if the front bench should behave itself a little, I call Claire Adamson to be followed by Donald Cameron. Thank you, presiding officer. We live in a very uncertain world. Our economy is dependent on our workforce. But it seems that our world is less tolerant, less caring and less just. <coughs> the announcement from the US that the DACA programme introduced by President Obama, giving rights and legal status to Mexicans who have lived their whole lives in the US, is to be scrapped, is one of the, the most retrograde steps of a democratic government in years. And yet we seem to fare no better in the UK. If Guardian reports today are to be believed, there is a, an indication that there will be a register of non UK workers and indeed when we live in a, a country where the United Nations has described austerity as being full of systematic violations of the rights of people with disabilities <coughs> and the UN's United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability have called the UK government out for creating human catastrophe as already highlighted yesterday by my colleague Christina McKelvey then we must wonder 
what the future holds um, following Brexit and with the path that we seem to be taking at the moment. So I want to reflect not so much on the highline economy and climate change issues that were raised today, but on some of the words of the presiding of the First Minister yesterday. At its heart, the ambition to make our country the best place in the world in which to grow up and be educated, the best place to live, work in, visit and do business, the best place in which to be cared for in times of sickness, need or vulnerability, and the best place in which to grow old. Now, presiding officer, I can't think that there's a person in this chamber on any benches who can't agree to those aspirations and ambitions for our country. So while we talk of issues of economy and the climate change, I want to talk a little bit about the well-being of our citizens and why we need things like climate change, not least of which to improve the health of our nation and reduce things like pulmonary emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, that can lead to transplants. So on reflecting on the First Minister's words, I want to talk about an experience I had this summer. I attended the opening ceremony of the British Transplant Games in North Lanarkshire. The Games have been in existence for 30 years and the first Transplant Olympics took place in Portsmouth in 1978. Since the early beginnings, the competitors are known affectionately as Blooming Miracles. 17 cities across the UK have hosted the event, with North Lanarkshire hosting this summer. The Games are intended to show the benefits of transplantation, encouraging transplant patients to regain fitness, while increasing public awareness of the need for more people to join the NHS Organ Donation Register. And they also seek to thank and celebrate donor families and the gift of life. Events included children's walks, soft tennis for adults, darts, fishing, quite an eclectic group of sports. But I want to pay tribute to the range and number of teams who took part. Children's teams, city teams, teams for all airs and pairs from Dublin and Belfast to Cornwall, hospital teams, when it included some of the main clinical support workers who look after patients from Stoke Mandible, from Barts in London, to um, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow. Charity teams from the Anthony Nolan Trust, teams that included donors of um, bone marrow and also of organs, but the loudest cheer and the one that left not a dry eye in the house was for the donor families, without whom many people in the room would not have been there. I pay particular tribute to a school friend of mine, Karen Casey, Karen received a, a donated kidney and has been a tireless campaigner for organ, is, organ donation and its cause. Fundraising for these events by producing um, jewellery of, of donation angels in recognition of the transplant games. But Karen was the person who first brought to me the case for soft opt-out organ and tissue donation. So I am delighted that the programme for government includes such a bill. It will increase the number of cases where organ and tissue donation is authorised, but it will also ensure that safeguards will be there to minimise the risk of a person becoming a donor if they have not wished to donate. The second biggest cheer on that evening was when our Cabinet Secretary for Health confirmed the government's intention to legislate in this area and increase the already 45% of Scottish citizens who are registered. When we talk about the economy, when we talk about climate change, when we talk about this programme for government, it has to be about the wealth and well-being of all our citizens, about ensuring that our disabled, our sick people are in a position to be able to work, that they are not being constrained because PIP cuts mean that they lose their mobility cars and can no longer work and contribute to our economy. So this programme, I believe, will reinstill tolerance, reinstill caring and reinstill justice in Scotland. And it is one I will be immensely proud to support. Thank you. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Keith Brown. Donald Cameron.
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like many others, recess gave me the opportunity to travel the length and breadth of the region I represent and meet constituents across the Highlands and Islands, as well as local businesses and community organisations, to discuss the issues and concerns they have. And what was apparent from speaking to a range of people was that they are genuinely frustrated with the SNP's lack of focus on day-to-day -day issues over the last 12 months. So like many, I hope this programme for government will see a much greater focus on those everyday issues that concern our constituents. We can only wait and see. I'm also pleased to find myself in a new role covering the environment brief, and I look forward to working with the Cabinet Secretary and others so that we can meet the varying environmental challenges ahead. It is with that in mind that I broadly welcome the fact that issues affecting the environment and climate change are at the forefront of the government's legislative agenda for the coming year. There are areas of common ground, perhaps in this area more than in others. On climate change, I've long been aware of the need to ensure that we deliver a groundbreaking and ambitious climate change plan. After all, this plan will not only lay out the ambitions of this Parliament's approach to tackling climate change, but will be the foundation for every Parliament up until 2032. However, the draft plan has disappointed some, with groups like WWF Scotland noting that the draft plan fails to provide a credible route to achieving our climate change targets. It is therefore vital that we get it right, and I am delighted the First Minister found inspiration from the Scottish Conservatives in her statement yesterday. This spring, my colleague Maurice Golden published our approach to meeting our global climate change commitments. And it is clear that some of our aspirations that we put forward, such as the need to expand the number of electrical vehicle charging points and the desire to provide transition support to convert buses and taxis to renewable vehicles, have in some way or other been adopted in the programme for government. However, our plan went further. We proposed incentivising the ownership of electric vehicles through measures such as free town centre parking and the use of bus and taxi lanes. I'm intrigued by the electrified A9, a road I know and love, I've almost run out of fuel on that road many times. I look forward to almost running out of electricity on it in the future. <laughs> the First Minister likes to be bold and radical, and while there was an extensive list of policy commitments, many of which we will look at further, there was a lack of clarity on how these would be delivered, how much they will cost, and what targets the Scottish Government has set. One target we do know is that the government has followed the commitment by the UK government to phase out the sale of new petrol and diesel cars and vans. The date given is 2032. However, given their Cleaner Air for Scotland document from 2015 announced that their target would be 50% of all petrol and diesel fuel vehicles in cities, which would be phased out by 2030, this new target smacks of a hastily revised figure in a bid for political one-upmanship. It seems quite clear that the Scottish Government has taken inspiration from the lead of the UK Government here. On the deposit return scheme, we also read with interest the Government's proposals to design and implement a deposit return scheme. However, again, we need to see the detail of their proposals for such a scheme before we can offer any commitment. Whilst we have always recognised the need to be radical in our approach to reduce waste and litter, and we all want to promote recycling. We also need to be mindful that deposit return scheme proposals don't hamper small business. And I have to note the comments of the FSB, who say they are sorely disappointed the government has committed to this when they promised a full public consultation and detailed impact assessment. We must also bear in mind the burden which may be placed on local authorities and, more importantly, on individuals. On warmer homes, the Scottish Conservatives welcome the commitment to introduce a warm homes bill into Parliament, although this isn't a new announcement as it was included in last year's programme. We on these benches have been consistent in our calls, not just for new housing, but to improve the conditions of our existing stock. We want to see fuel poverty eliminated as well as contributing to our carbon reduction obligations. And with all that said, it is again disappointing there was little detail in the programme for government on what a warm homes bill would entail. We are concerned at the fact that there are no plans to improve energy efficiency in homes in the programme, as others in this chamber have noted. And yesterday, Ruth Davison reiterated our call to introduce a new target to ensure that every home is energy efficiency rated C or above by the end of the next decade. So today I again call on the government to commit to that in their Warm Homes Bill. Uh, on emissions, the government uh, programme includes a raft of measures which seeks to reduce transport emissions, 
which would be welcomed were it not for the fact that the government has cut their budget for transport emissions mitigation by almost 15 per cent. The government promises to invest more money into walking and cycling schemes. Again, we will be eager to look at this more closely because we know that despite increased investment, there has only been a 0.2 per cent increase in everyday bike journeys in the past decade and the everyday cycle use sits at 2.2% only. In conclusion, presiding officer, as I said when I first entered Parliament, I will not oppose things just for the sake of it. The Scottish Conservatives made that commitment too, but we also committed to holding the SNP to account. An inescapable conclusion to be drawn from this programme for government is that, notwithstanding the good intentions behind some of this policy platform, there is a paucity of new ideas and vision. All the glossy brochures in the world, all the talk of boldness, can't hide the fact that this is a government which is tired, a government whose sights have lowered, and a government whose ambition has diminished. Yeah. Thank you, President. Yeah. Thank you. And I call our final speaker this afternoon, Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, uh, we've had uh, an outline, obviously, of the programme for government from the First Minister yesterday and also from a colleague today, Rosanna Cunningham, and rather than repeat that, I'll try and address some of the points uh, and comments made by members, although I think it's worth bearing in mind that statement by Rosanna Cunningham, that there is, at the root of this, around $23 trillion worth of climate-smart global opportunities in terms of the economy uh, around climate change uh, and the environment. So we should bear that in mind. Uh, given that high ambition, I think it was disappointing to hear from uh, Dean Lockhart at the start of the debate. It seems to be that Tory economic policy now is reduced to try and claim credit for things which other administrations uh, have implemented. The South of Scotland Enterprise Agency, apparently a Tory idea, in government for 18 years and did nothing about it. The SNP come in and we deliver it. But the Tories want to try and uh, claim credit for that. It's also true to say, and I, I hear Murdo Fraser shouting, I should say, and I, I, I hate to disappoint Murdo Fraser, but I know that his preference is for spending money on trams in Edinburgh rather than duelling the A9. When we talk about an electric A9, it's not going to involve trams, Murdo. I'm sorry about that, but that is not part of our plans, even if that is your preference in terms of investment. <laughs> and of course, that leads us on He's to the... Yeah, I, I will give it to Murdo Fraser, yes. Murdo Fraser. I'm, I'm very grateful to Keith Brown for giving me. Can you tell us by what year Will the Scottish Government have completed as many miles of dual carriageway on the A9 as a previous Conservative Government did? I, th I think Murdo, Murdo Fraser rankles at the fact that this Government is committed to duelling the entire A9 between Perth and Inverness by 2025, something the Tories in 18 years never committed to do, but we will do that. And since we've raised the issue of expenditure on infrastructure, which is extremely important for the economy, we've seen the opening of the Queen's Ferry Crossing, but you wouldn't know that. Not a single comment from the Conservatives about the Queen's Ferry Crossing. £1.3 billion of expenditure in relation to that. Not a mention, of course, of the Borders Rail, except in as far as, of course, the Tories might try, try and claim credit for that. They were going to do it 30 years ago, so it's really their idea in the first place, perhaps or any mention of the improvements that we've seen in the school estate, nor indeed in terms of the housing, 30,000 houses in the last parliament. These things are absolutely vital uh, for the economy. Uh, Jackie Bailey uh, told me to sit down and listen to this. Uh, that was her uh, comment. I wouldn't uh, dream of saying the same thing to her, but she should, of course, have some recognition of the fact when she talks about the living wage uh, and low-wage employers that it was her party that specifically stopped this parliament from having the power in setting yeah. a living wage. Yeah. At least yeah. a bit of humility in relation well, to that. To would have gone to, not at this stage, <laughs> not at this stage. I'll come back to that. Uh, I'll, come, I'll come back to you. Uh, it's also true to say that Stuart Stevenson mentioned, quite rightly as well, of course, the point that uh, North Sea oil is a huge bonus. It should have been a huge bonus to Scotland and to the UK. But instead, and in contrast to Norway, where they have approaching £1 trillion worth of investment to underpin their economy, what we've got is £1.9 trillion of debt under this Conservative government in the UK. That is why the economy, the finances of the UK government are in such a dire strait. And they should at least have acknowledged that. Not to mention, of course, there was talk about taking time to do things. When are the UK government going to appoint their UK oil and gas ambassador? Promised by David Cameron with some urgency in 2016. No mention of that uh, from, uh, from uh, the, the Tories. I think Mike Rumbles had a, an extremely long uh, rant about uh, Fergus Ewing, but like many others, 
Uh, also failed to acknowledge in relation to connectivity, in fact, I, I can't say if Mike did mention that, connect, Mike Rumble's mentioned connectivity, mentioned by a number of people who simply don't seem to understand the role of the UK government. I could mention Jamie Green previously, Dean Lockhart, making statements which clearly show they are unaware of the role of the UK government in terms of connectivity. No, yes, I'll take it, uh, an intervention from Jamie Green. Jamie Green. Uh, the, 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 thank you for uh, giving way. Uh, isn't it the case that the UK government asked the Scottish government to administer these contracts, gave you a whole big chunk of money to do it, and it's your government's failure to deliver the people of Scotland with good broadband? Is the reality of the situation? Shouldn't you be apologising for that? <laughs> Secretary. I think even a cursory glance of the way that the paltry money apportioned to try and achieve this, given the fact the £4 billion which the UK government took in in a previous licensing round for mobile contracts, the paltry money apportioned to this, having to be made up by the Scottish government and Fergus Ewing to try and achieve more, as we heard during the debate, than the UK government promises in terms of bandwidth, perhaps a bit of humility and a bit of research from Jamie Green, who actually I would acknowledge, I think, is the only Conservative member to have tweeted something positive about the Queen's Ferry crossing, so I would, I would thank him for that. Uh, you must have done that. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm approaching my last uh, minute. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Jackie Bailey. I would have taken it, but I can't. I'm approaching my last minute. Also, okay, uh, of course, order, we saw this statement from Peter Chapman, who assured us that we should just accept an assurance that the UK government has told us we're going to get massive new powers after Brexit. And then, when asked, he couldn't mention a single power that we would achieve after Brexit. Not a single power. And interestingly, and I heard from um, Mr. Halko Johnson about this as well, all the concerns of his constituents, it would appear that not a single Tory MSP has had a concern expressed about Brexit by their constituents. They expressed no concern in any of these debates on the economy about Brexit. They expressed not to know that the UK government has a role in the Scottish economy, which by extension, of course, must mean that the UK government has no Scottish economic policy. And that is a damning indictment of the negligence of the UK government yeah, yeah. in relation to Scotland. Yeah, yeah. I think the important point in relation to this debate is the opportunities which uh, Rosanna Cunningham outlined at the start. $23 trillion worth of investment. And we have to now focus on making sure that Scotland leads the way in relation to that. We have to seize these new opportunities. It meets some of the obstacles that we have, of course, the Brexit-imposed problems that we have from the UK government, the blinkered approach of the Scottish Tories who don't even recognise that Brexit's a problem, even though every single economist will tell you that, and their constituents, if they talk to them, will tell you that as well, not least in relation to Mr Halko Johnson. The hotels and his constituents, you have told me about the concerns they have about losing employees because of Brexit, but apparently they haven't told you that. At least acknowledge the problem, then you might be taken with a bit more credibility in relation to your economic policy. You have a clear lack of an economic policy. There is a, a, a programme for government which is cleaner, which is greener, which is seeking to achieve more equality in Scotland and to achieve more, uh, a more prosperous Scotland. Those are things which you would think we could all get behind, and I would hope we'd have that in the rest of the debate on this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And the debate on the Scottish Government's programme for government will continue tomorrow. Uh, I would encourage uh, ask all members to be present for the closing speeches at the end of the day. The next item of business is consideration of four business motions. Motion 7510, setting out a business programme, and motion 7379, 7380 and 7381 on stage one timetables for three bills. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against any of these motions to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the four, four motions. Move formally. Thanks very much. No member has asked to speak against the motions. Their question is therefore that motions 7510, 7379, 7380 and 7381 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the bureau to move motion 7382 on the approval of an SSI. Moved. Thank you very much. And there is one question to be put. Now that we come to decision time, and the question is that the motion 7382 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And we'll move on now to members' business. In the name of Christine Graham, we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats. <laughs>